So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about something called barrier synchronizers. And I'll first give you an overview of what a barrier synchronizer is, and then I'll talk about a couple of different barrier synchronizers that are common in Java. So what we're going to talk about here is what is a barrier synchronizer and how it is used to allow threads to coordinate their weighting on different kinds of conditions. And you'll see that there's a couple of different criteria that are used to distinguish the different mechanisms that Java provides as barrier synchronizers. We'll also talk about a human known use of barrier synchronization that's easy to remember and, and relatively accurate. So first, what is barrier synchronization? So a barrier is a synchronization mechanism that halts the progress of one or more threads at a particular point. Now, if you take a look at Wikipedia and you look up barrier, you'll find a whole discussion of memory barriers. And those are not quite what we mean by barrier synchronization, although they have a few things loosely in common. Uh, a memory barrier is typically used to flush hashes to ensure that memory is properly visible, uh, which is somewhat what we're talking about here. But we're really using this at a higher level of abstraction. So barrier synchronization is really used to coordinate the operations of multiple threads. And you can take a look here for more information about this. You can use barriers in several ways. You can use them as so-called entry barriers, which require one or more com concurrent computations to wait until something is initialized or until you're ready to go. Uh, I always think of that kind of like the horse race example, where you've got all the horses lined up in their pens waiting to start, right? So that's a barrier. You don't want them to start until they're all there. So that's an entry barrier. Uh, here's a simple common example. You might have the main thread spawn a bunch of other threads, and all of these threads need to wait for the main thread to finish doing some initialization before they start to run. So in that case, you could have a barrier that would have a count of one, and all these threads would wait until this count was zero, and the main thread would go ahead and then decrement that count after it was finished with its initialization, and then all these other threads could start to run. Right? So that's kind of like the starting gate at a, at a horse race where you wait till all the horses are there, um, and then someone fires the gun and they all run. Sort of. We'll see there's some subtleties involved in this, but that's basically the idea. These are also sometimes called latches. So you're latching the start of something. Another form of barrier is what's called an exit barrier. And what you do here is you block all the threads until they're all finished. So you make them all wait. They'll all have to wait at a common point. And only when they're all done do you continue on to whatever you're going to do next. So that's what's called an exit barrier. So in this case, you might have another situation where you've got a main thread and after the main thread starts up, all the worker threads, it'll do a few things, and then it'll go ahead and wait for all the worker threads to finish before it does something else. So that's an exit barrier. So you might have a situation here where you have four threads, therefore the barrier has a count of four, and as each of the threads leaves, they decrement the count by one, and when it reaches zero, the main thread can then continue. So that's an exit barrier. And then there's also something which is, to some extent, orthogonal to this discussion, called a cyclic barrier. And this allows groups of threads to coordinate either their entry or exit from some computation at n mass, and then they all cycle back around again and start over. So you can imagine examples like an assembly line where you have a pool of workers working on things that move by, like cars. And so they, you know, the car, the next car comes in the assembly line, they all start doing their thing. When they're all finished, they all step back, the car moves, the next car comes in, they all start over again. Right? So that's kind of a cyclic-like approach. And you can either have a fixed or variable pool of threads that are used and coordinated. And if every time you're done with the cycle, you decide whether or not you want to keep going or whether you want to finish. Now, there, there are basically three main types of barriers, barrier synchronizers in Java. There's a countdown latch, a cyclic barrier, or something called a phaser. We're going to focus today on countdown latches and cyclic barriers because they're what you need for the next assignment. Uh, and we'll mention phasers in passing, but we won't talk about them in detail. So we can categorize these things in a couple of different ways. One way to do it is in terms of the number of iterations. Do they, do, do they work one time or can they work 
in a cyclic way. So it turns out that a countdown latch is a one-shot deal, only works once. Uh, in contrast, a cyclic barrier, as the name implies, can be used for cyclic processing. You can also use it for one-shot processing as well, but it's often used in you know, cyclic things. Um, interesting enough, phasers, which are this very, very uh, everything in the kitchen sink approach, can be used for either one-shot or cyclic approaches. There's also the issue, another dimension is how many parties are there? Are they a fixed number of parties, parties equal thread, or can there be a variable number of parties? So, as we'll see, the countdown latch um, is typically used for a fixed number of things, as is the cyclic barrier, whereas the phaser can be used for variable numbers of things. So, it's, again, it's more flexible. These categories are not really mutually exclusive, and we'll see more about that later. Here's a quick human known use of barrier synchronization. So, imagine a museum tour guide where you're going to have a group of people going through a museum room by room. And so you have a tour guide, and the tour guide might, you know, say, wait until 10.30 when everybody, the next tour goes, right? So at 10.30, all the people who've shown up with their tickets, they're going to start en masse to go in. So the tour guide might either wait for the number of people to show up who bought tickets, so that might be the first thing, that's the entry barrier part. And then the exit barrier might be that the museum itself has to wait to close until all the tourists have left. So that's the entry, the entry barrier, exit barrier. The tour guide is responsible for making sure that those things happen, and they work as a group. And you might also have sort of a cyclic barrier approach where the tour guide waits for everybody to finish exploring a particular room, and then they all move en masse to the next room. That may or may not be the best analogy. I think that assembly line example might be a little bit better because it kind of shows you've got a group of things that wait and then do their work en masse on something. When they're finished, they step back. The next thing comes along, you start over again. But it's basically the same idea. And as we'll see, you could use either fixed size or variable size number of tourists in this model. Uh, although it might get confusing in practice if tourists start to disappear. Okay, so that's the end of the overview discussion of barrier synchronizers.